James chapter 2, starting with verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food? And if one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself <coughs> is not accomplished by action, is dead. Let's go to God in prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us. God, as we just come to your word today, we just pray your guidance and direction on how to help us to understand how to fulfill your word. So please give us that wisdom, guidance, and direction. Give me the words of wisdom to explain it accurately and give us a, uh, ears to hear and mind to understand, eyes to see the truth, and a heart willing to follow you. We just pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You know, we're getting into the time of the, time of the season where everybody is, is feeling like it's time to give. You know, this is the time that you see everybody out there in the, in the stores with the little bells ringing, and you see people always asking for donations. And, and as we come as a church, we, we need to ask the question, do we really need to help others? You know, the Bible commands us to help those in need. We just read this here in James chapter 2. That James says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, if we see someone who is hungry or needing clothes, and we just say, keep warm and well fed, we're not practicing the true Christian faith. <clears throat> but of course, then we start to look, and the church has just a limited amount of resources. No matter if you're talking about a church that's full of just 20 people or 20,000 people. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a Christian who only has $100 to his name or $100 million to his name. All of us have limited resources. And as we look into this world and we see people who need help, we see the fact that we've got to be wise with our resources and do the best we can with what God has blessed us with. So then when we look at the fact that we have a limited amount of resources, we have to ask the question, well, then who are we to help? Because the truth of the matter is, we don't have enough resources to just keep throwing it out there to just anything and everyone. We have to be wise and use what God has given us according to wisdom. So when we look at this question, we must ask, who are we to help? When we look at this, I want us to start first with what Jesus said about the issue. Turn to Matthew chapter 25, start with verse 31 through 34, or 46. Matthew chapter 25, 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put his sheep on the right and his goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. If I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did, for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. 
Many will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. As we're looking at this passage here, Matthew 25, starting with verse 31, we see that how we treat the church is how we treat Jesus. So what I mean by that is, is our attitude towards His church reflects our attitude to Jesus Christ. In the scripture, we don't see this attitude of you can love Jesus but not the church. Because Jesus takes it personal. Whenever somebody persecuted the church, he said it was persecuting me. Whenever somebody injured the church, he talked about them injuring him. The church is a body of Jesus Christ. Therefore, what one does or does not do for his church, his fellow Christians, he's having that attitude towards Christ. And one of the things that we understand in this world is we have fellow Christians who are suffering for their faith. There are people today who are facing prison or are in prison around the world for their faith. Now we're just not talking about like an American prison either. We're talking about across the world. With true hardship inside. And where people are suffering. We see Christians who are facing persecution for their faith. They are dealing without clothes, food, sometimes shelter, all for the sake of Christ. We know that this is happening around the world. And we, as a church, a local congregation, have the ability to help them. We have the resources. No matter what you think, you have more than one set of clothes. Or if you have food in the pantry, you are more well off than most people around the world. And we who have plenty are required by the scripture to give to those who are in need. We cannot hoard it to ourselves. If we have an extra coat and we see somebody without it, we're required to give. If we have extra food and we do not give to those who have who are in need of food, we sin. We have the ability to give, and we have the ability to find out what others need. We have the ability and the opportunity. Now, our reaction to their problems says a lot about us. In this parable that Jesus told, and he's talking about the end of time, he's talking about separating the sheep from the goats. It wasn't a statement on those who were in need. It was a statement about those who gave or did not give. When we know that the problem exists and we do nothing, we are the goats in this parable. And Christ is not pleased. Now, we also go into the fact that the Bible not only just talks about those who are suffering like this, we talk about more that maybe we see on, on a regular basis. People that maybe we deal with in our lives. In the scripture, one of those people who were always in desperate needs in biblical times were widows. 1 Timothy chapter 5, starting with verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Starting with verse 30. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, you should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family, and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray to and to ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions. Two, so that no one will be open to blame. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. No widow may be put on a list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her good deeds such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list. 
For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become uh, idlers, but also gossips and busybodies. Same things they ought not to. So I counsel younger widows not to marry, to have children. I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. If any woman who has a believer has widows in her family, she should help them and not let the church be burdened with them so that the church can help those who are really in need. As we're looking at this passage here, in 1 Timothy 5, we see that during biblical times, widows were considered to be among those who were helpless in society. What we're saying about this is, is that during this time, if a woman had uh, lost her husband, then she would be without the support system that the husband brought. She would be without someone who could give her financial support or protection in the household. So therefore, they were considered to be among the weak and the helpless in society. And the church was to, care, was to call to take care of of them for their situation. The church, was taught, called, the church was called to take care of them. One of the places we see this again is in James chapter 1, starting with verse 27, where James simply says this, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James is telling us in the same book that we just read earlier where it talked about faith and deeds and, and not passing on some brother or sister who is hungry or need clothes or need a home. He is saying here in James 1 verse 27 that true and faultless religion is to look after orphans and widows in their distress. That the church was to take a special care of those who were helpless in the society. They were supposed to take care of those who would be harmed the most because they had no one looking out for their needs. However, if the widow had Christians in the family, they were to take care of her. In other words, what, what, Timothy, or what Paul says here in 1 Timothy is that if a widow has a believing relative, a child or a grandchild, or in-laws, someone who is of close relation, that it was the responsibility of the Christian to be personally involved and take care of them so that the church could not be burdened down with them. In other words, what we're seeing here is a distinction. There were two groups of classifications. Well, actually, there's going to be a third group here in a minute. There's going to be these groups of classifications. Now, these widows were supposed to be taken care of. But Paul is saying, if you as a Christian have a family member that needs help, you are required by God to be personally involved. You can't say it's not my responsibility. You can't say that i got something else. You are supposed to jump in and help where you can. Now, as I said, there's actually three classifications here. Of widows. The first group, we'll talk about those who have a believing family member, was to be taken care of by the family. The second group was younger widows who could change their situation. If they had the opportunity as a younger widow to improve their situation, they were called upon to do that and not let the church be burdened with them. The third group was an elderly widow who had no opportunity to change her faith, and who had no family member to take care of her. At that point, the church is to be family for those who have no family. If a person has no family and can step in and be involved, then the church is to step up. The church is to be family for those who have no family in this world. And guys, we see this as a problem that's occurring more and more. 
people, either children who have no parents that are personally involved or even the elderly who have no one to take care of them. When we see that the, that the people have no family, we step in. But it's not just the widows and it's not just the Christians who are being persecuted that Jesus is concerned about in the scriptures. The church is also supposed to act when we learn of natural disasters. An example of this is in the early church. Look at Acts chapter 11, 27 through 30. Acts chapter 11, 27 through 30. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and, through the Holy Spirit, predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. They did the, This they did by sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Natural disasters leave people in great need. Whenever a hurricane strikes, whenever a tornado strikes, whenever an earthquake strikes, whenever a forest fire strikes, or whenever a famine strikes, people are left without home, drinkable water, food, clothing, some of the essentials of life. Some people lose everything in a matter of minutes. And they literally have nothing to fall back upon. We're seeing this out in California with the forest fires. We have seen this in people who have suffered here recently due to the various hurricanes that have hit the United States and other parts of the world. People, come, people survive the natural disasters with little or nothing to live on at that moment. <coughs> One of the problems sometimes we have whenever these natural disasters occur is people like to play judge, jury in these cases and say, well, they must have done something wrong. Oh, well, they must be being punished by God. Oh, well, it was their own stupidity. Hey, we should not always make judgments about the causes of these natural disasters. I know in Scripture we look and see at times when God was judging people like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah, like he did in the times of Noah and the ark. But you know what? You know why we know those were acts of God? It's because he revealed it to his prophets. We don't know that today. In fact, a natural disaster could occur because of a man-made problem. Some, some crazy person did go and light a fire and start a forest fire. It could just happen because nature, that's the, the pattern of hurricanes, or it's a pattern of tornadoes, could be a judgment of God that we do not know. could just be because we live in a fallen and broken world, and sin has a consequence as a whole, and that we all deal with the consequence of sin. But it's not your job to sit there and play judge and jury about what happens when a natural disaster occurs. And Christians who have plenty should give to those who are suffering. Again, we can go into our closets and see the extra clothes and pants and, and socks that we have. Maybe extra pairs of shoes that we have that we don't use very often. We can look in the pantry and look at, at canned vegetables and canned fruit that we have not ate yet. We can look into the bank account and see that little money that's just right there that we can send over. Whenever we see a natural disaster that has occurred and we who have plenty and we see people without, it's time for us to give. You see... There are opportunities to minister during these moments. There's opportunities to show the love of Christ. There's opportunities to give to people physically, but also to give them a message spiritually. There are groups who go out there, such as Ides and others, who go out there during natural disasters, and they give people medicine. They give people medical aid. They give people food and temporary shelter. They give what is needed during that time. 
Now these are all people we see that we are to commit to give to and that we should use our resources for. Does the Bible ever give us situations where it says, you know what? Don't. Don't give in this instance. Well, let's take a look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 15. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 6 through 15. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who commanded you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you have received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle. They are not busy, but are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread that they eat. And as for you, brothers, never tire of doing what is right. If anyone does not obey our instructions in this letter, take special note of him, do not associate with him, in order that he may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. First of all, I want us to understand that there is a big difference between people who cannot work and people who will not work. A cannot is somebody who has been injured, who is sick, who has become handicapped, who has an age restriction. Maybe they are too young to work, maybe they're too old to work. Maybe it's somebody who is desiring to, but through the economy or through the problems in their society cannot actually get work. If a person cannot work, they're in a situation where they, they need help. That is people that we should focus on and give them the helping hand while they're in this time. The person who will not work has the ability, they are of age, they have no serious health restrictions, they have opportunities around them, and yet choose not to do it because of laziness, because of, or some other problem. And what the scripture is dealing with here is people who will not. Not the cannot, but the will not. A person who has the ability to change their situation should work to change their situation. In other words, these are not people who are helpless. These are people who can do better but are choosing not to. So why does God tell us not to give to them? It's not because we're trying to be mean, and it's not because we're trying to be hateful, and it's not because we are making a judgment on them. Helping these individuals takes away resources from those who are really in need. In other words, again, remember the fact that we have a limited amount of resource, we have a limited amount of money or supplies or things at our disposal. So when we look at situations, we may have to say, this person over here cannot change this situation. This person can over here, and they will not. We tell the person over here, since you can, since you can change your situation, you will not do so, we cannot help you because we have to give to those who are really in need. We have to make those judgments. We have to make those calls. A lot of times people in the world say that's a church being mean. That's a church picking favorites. It's not. If we are not careful with our resources, if we are not wise with what God has given us, then we can't help those who are in need. And guys, there are a lot more people in this world in true need than you understand. The majority of the world lives in true poverty. Look, if you got a home that you're sleeping in tonight with a bed, with heat or air conditioning, depending upon the time of the year, if you have food that will last you more than a few days, and you have electricity in your house, you're not poor. You may think you are. That's not poverty. 
Poverty is people who have no running water in their homes. Poverty is for people who have to take care of their one pair of shoes, their one pair of clothes, because that's all they have to shelter them from the world. Poverty is people who don't have more than one meal a day if they get that. Quit thinking of yourself as being in poverty because it doesn't help. True poverty exists in the world. And the average American is more well off than the majority of people in this world. True poverty exists. And we have to be wise with the resources that we have to help those who are truly in need. How are you helping people today? How are you helping those who are truly in need? If you're a Christian, your faith compels you to give to those in need. Not to hoard it for yourself, not to keep it for yourself, not to give God whatever is left over, but to give to God what is there. And give it to those who are in desperate need in this world. You know, it's a funny thing. We sit here and gave thanks on Thursday and turned around on Friday and stormed stores to fulfill our greed. The question is that, not are you fulfilling your greed, but are you helping to give to the needs of others? Today, Jesus Christ did that for us. Jesus Christ looked down upon us and knew we could not save ourselves. He knew that we were lost. Today, if you know and recognize that you are lost, we're giving you the opportunity today to find your salvation through faith in Jesus Christ by confessing Him as your Lord and Savior, repenting of your sins, and being baptized for forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you need to make that decision, we encourage you to do it today as we stand and sing our invitational song.